let me um, very warmly welcome uh, all attendees as well as our guest speaker, Dr. Isuru Dharmaratna, uh, the postgraduate research fellow from the Toronto Rehabilitation Research Institute, Canada. Uh, Dr. Dharmaratna, thank you so much uh, for your interest and for agreeing to Dr. Shamini to conduct this program. And also we do this on behalf of the uh, uh, SLMA, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation. Dr. Shamini is a very active member uh, uh, in the uh, our rehabilitation uh, expert committee. Uh, so I'm very thankful to Shamini for agreeing to organize this for the benefit of speech therapists, as well as for all others who are with interest in this topic. So uh, let me now invite uh, uh, Dr. Shamini uh, Hityarachi for, to uh, moderate the program. Shamini, over to you. Thank you very much, Madam. Um, I'm just putting my video on just for a second to say hello to everyone and to uh, very, very warmly welcome everyone, as Madam said, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation. Let me put my video off because connectivity isn't great. Um, so we are so delighted to have this online workshop in neonatal feeding management because as a speech therapist myself, this is very close to my heart. And the fact that so many of you have joined at 6, 6 p.m. on a Sunday is really testament to... Um, is, is really testament to your commitment uh, in offering better and more evidence-based um, management for um, within neonatal feeding. It is one area within speech therapy where literally uh, it is a matter of life and death. And so it is so important, to the, particularly in these times where training is very, very difficult to come by, is incredibly expensive. It, we are delighted to have um, Dr. Isuru Dharmatna as a resource person. For people who, it's unlikely that people don't know you, Isuru, but for the occasion, I don't know, for maybe a person who doesn't know, who's not in speech therapy, Isuru was a brilliant student um, at, at our faculty and passed with a first class in, in speech and language therapy. Um, and got the gold medal, the Sheila was a memorial gold medal as um, the leading student of that year. She then joined the staff and was very supportive in starting a pediatric clinic um, at, at our faculty. Um, she then received a World Bank Award, uh, which took her to the University of Auckland, where she read for her PhD. Again, her PhD was actually uh, in pediatric dysphagia, and I'm sure she'll reference it as we go along. Uh, Isuru, I know, is very modest and probably won't tell you that she was also awarded the, the dean's, she was on the dean's list for her uh, PhD research, and she has several publications um, in reputable journals. Clinically, she used to work at IIT as well as supported the DQ at the North Colombo Teaching Hospital. And her specialist area is neonatal feeding. Uh, to me, Isrui is the leading speech and language clinician in this area. Um, and as, as Madam said, she is now on a postdoctoral research fellowship at a, at a very prestigious um, institute, the Toronto Rehabilitation Research Institute in Canada. Um, she's also a committee member of um, the International Pediatric Feeding Dis uh, Disorders Alliance, um, and it is much sought after speaker there. So the format for today is that uh, Dr. Isru will present the workshop for about an hour and a half, and then she has very, very graciously agreed to take some questions at the end of it, so we can go on for another say 20, 30 minutes if needed. So, uh, please feel free to send in your questions, type them, or feel free to speak at the end. Uh, over to you, uh, Isra, it's my very great pleasure to invite you. Thank you so much, Madam. Um, 
Thank you so much, uh, Padma Madam and Shamini Madam, um, uh, for inviting me for the, uh, the talk today. Good evening to all of you. Um, and thank you so much, Shamini Madam, for that generous introduction. I'm so glad to have uh, many of you today joining this talk, um, knowing that it's Sunday evening. So um, really shows the commitment. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm currently um, out of uh, Sri Lanka for my fellowship. So it's always good to see uh, many familiar faces um, joining today. So let's start the session now. Um, so before start, here are my disclosures. I received a salary uh, from the University of uh, Health Network Canada. I received no monetary compensation for my contribution uh, for the following non-financial relationships relevant to the content of this session. I'm a com committee member or a council member of the SLSLP, and I contribute as the inclusion representative and a committee member at the International Pediatric Feeding Disorders Alliance. Um, and I'm a fellow at the Higher Education Academy UK and a member at um, Dysphagia Research Society. So um, before I go into the session, um, I would like to know who are joining today for this talk. Uh, so when actually um, approached for the talk initially, I assumed that it's going to be the uh, audience going to be only speech and language therapist, but later found out that it's going to be a broader audience, which is great. So um, I wanted to keep the content very um, generic to um, apl applicable to be applicable to all of us. Um, but for us to get to know each other, um, you can use this um, survey to tell me uh, which profession are you in and where do you work. So you can see there's a QR code. We are all very fond of QR codes, um, thanks to our fuel crisis. So let's use some of that skills. And if you can scan the QR code, or uh, otherwise you can go to the link from your phone, www.mentimeter.com. And if you use the code 62844269, you can join the question. And your responses are anonymous just for us to get to know who we have in the in the meeting. Um, so I will share uh, the responses on the screen. First uh, slide, if you can get to this Mentimeter is like, what is your profession? Um, are you an SLT, SLT student, um, medical doctor, occupational therapist? So let me share that screen. Uh, if you could uh, respond, I don't know whether, let me know if it doesn't work. Okay, I can see one response, so it works. Okay, I can see this. Please. I'm not sure whether we have, um, any students other than learning um, SLT, but if you are a student, non-SLT, please still select SLT students. So at least, sorry, I don't have an option for that. Okay. Because we started a little bit late, I'll thank you so much for the responses. Um, good to know that we have um, um, doctors um, in this session. 
let me move to our learning outcomes and then um, please don't close your uh, Mentimeter tab uh, because we will get back to some of the questions later on in the session as well. Okay. Um, so here are some learning outcomes for this talk. Um, I will highlight some of the unique features of neonatal feeding, which make them so different to older children or adults with dysphagia for us to get a little foundation. Um, secondly, we need to know who are the at-risk group of neonates to develop feeding difficulties um, in order for us to identify them in our clinical practice. Um, the third point is probably uh, the highlight of this talk. We will be discussing principles of management uh, by reviewing the evidence around them. Finally, I will share some strategies to uh, facilitate a positive feeding environment to, to any neonate at any setting by applying relevant theories. So um, let's get to the first topic. And uh, please uh, feel free to uh, send a message in the chat section if there's anything um, that you need, need me to change um, rate of speech, or maybe if you want me to go back to the slide. Um, neonatal feeding. Neonatal feeding involves sucking milk from breast uh, during breastfeeding and teeth when bottle fed. This process is only possible when the baby uses the tongue to create a vacuum and extract milk due to pressure difference. After getting a milk bolus into the oral cavity, baby starts to swallow and then respiration. This pattern or synchrony is known as suck swallow breath coordination. This cycle becomes rapid during the first month of life of newborns. As their nervous system is still developing and immature, they have a reflexive pattern of swallowing without volitional control. There's also a gradual transition to milk intake within the first month. Um, if we look at the uh, milk intake, milk volume doubles at the end of the first month and significant variables to suck swallow breath coordination can be seen within the first three months and continue to show variability up to six months. Differences of swallowing mechanisms in neonates and old children are associated with the differences in upper aerodigestive system um, anatomically. So these anatomical changes occur as we grow, um, indicating these swallowing differences are distinguished by the changes due to neurophysiological development. Um, for example, neonates have a much smaller oral cavity in which tongue takes up the most of its capacity as it can help with suck and solo uh, feeding pattern. Um, another example is that neonates are edentulous or they don't have teeth, um, while older children get teeth, which is a requirement for them to support eating solid food. Um, here I want to show uh, the primary uh, functional differences in swallowing de um, development across lifespan. Uh, the first set of pictures here show a spectrum of how we move from total dependency in feeding to self-feeding um, as older children or adults. Neonatal feeding um, cannot happen without the mother if breastfeeding and without a feeder if bottle fed. So it's important that uh, we know that in neonates, feeding is not only about the baby itself. The second set of pictures indicate the differences in food textures and consistency. So neonates fully depend on breast milk or formula milk, which is closer to thin liquid consistency. And our food textures become complex as we grow from pureed food to semitic to regular rice and curry, kotu, everything. 
This last set of pictures indicate how feeding or swallowing difficulties are indicated at different ages. Adults or older children can complain of dysphagia or difficulty in swallowing, which is a symptom. But new needs and young children are unable to complain or report it as a symptom, but only demonstrating the effect of compromised following. Especially when it comes to neonates, these indications are so primal, which could mainly be crying or other signs of discomfort. So let's move on to identifying red flags um, or causes, risk factors, um, for neonates to develop feeding difficulties. This is important because it will help us to refer these babies to relevant professionals to offer appropriate screening and assessments as early as possible to follow up. The most common cause of feeding disorder in newborn babies is prematurity and low birth weight. The earlier the baby is born, the higher the risk. I will address how this is important in deciding management options um, later in our talk. Second cause is having respiratory conditions such as laryngomalacia, tracheoesophageal fistula, cystic fibrosis, and laryngeal webs. These conditions affect respiratory function of the babies, resulting in dysfunctions in sexual breath coordination that I mentioned before. Next is cardiac conditions like tetralogy of palate, uh, congenital heart diseases. Similar to respiratory conditions, these babies will have dysfunctional sex follow breath coordination due to the difficulties in respiration and blood circulation. Another cause is syndromic conditions leading to structural deficits in the orofacial um, region. Um, conditions like um, Pierre Robin syndrome, Down syndrome. These orofacial structural anomalies affect uh, baby's latching uh, into the uh, mother's uh, nipple or the bottle teeth, and also oral phase of swallowing, which require feeding intervention. Next is trauma or birth complications, um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, meconium aspiration, neonatal stroke are very common causes affecting swallowing physiology in neonates. These conditions also have a long-term impact to child development by leading to conditions like cerebral palsy. Finally, postnatal factors such as environmental or we call as maternal factors. Some babies have difficulties in feeding, not due to issues with their swallow physiology, but due to other causes. For example, babies with mothers who struggle to breastfeed due to certain illnesses or medications um, like going through radiotherapy or substance abuse like heroin abuse, alcohol abuse, or uh, mothers who are dealing with postpartum depression and mothers who have lactation problems, uh, these babies will have challenging feeding experience. So uh, it's really important to emphasize that mothers should be encouraged and seen positively at all times during our intervention um, because their mental status plays a significant role in improving the quality of feeding experience of their babies. So we will talk about it um, in depth later on. Um, also babies um, who are developing neonatal jaundice or neonatal seizures are at risk of developing feeding uh, difficulties as well. So that is why it is recommended that all babies at NICU, um, NICU to have feeding screening um, conducted and to arrange a follow-up with speech and language therapist for further um, necessary actions. Let's focus on why we need to improve our resources for babies born with prematurity and no other medical complications that I mentioned uh, previously. Um, to give you a little bit of an um, picture about what's the current situation, I will share two examples from different times of world history to show how long we have come in neonatal care. 
the black and white uh, image on the top right side um, is a picture of uh, Patrick Kennedy, son of US President John F. Kennedy, being transported to Boston Children's Hospital in an incubator in 1963. Uh, Patrick was born at 34 weeks and five days and measured around 2.1 kilograms. Not so bad, um, uh, low birth weight, but still not really um, bad. He received top medical care available in the whole world from the experts in the field, being the son of US president, but tragically passed away after 39 hours um, since birth. The cause of death was what we call now as respiratory distress syndrome. It's known that this tragic loss of Patrick influenced um, President Kennedy to um, initiate new laws to grant a huge funds to newborn medical research in the US. The bottom right colored image of um, the two happy babies tells us a different story. Um, they are Harry and Harley Crane, uh, born in 2021 to a middle-class family in the UK. I assume that you have um, seen this story in news recently. They became the most premature twins in the UK. They were born at 22 weeks and five days and measured 500 grams each, extremely low birth weight. Also, interestingly, they were born more than a week before the UK's legal abortion age limit, which is 24 weeks. Because of that, they were given zero chance of survival and were considered a miscarriage at birth. But fortunately, uh, the parents found a hospital that still intervene um, to deliveries uh, at 23 gestational weeks. And they, the twins received necessary medical intervention and spent 140 days in the NICU before going home. Even though they are out of threat to survival, they have been receiving lots of support for their development. So the point that I want to make is that over the last few decades, um, medical development in this field has increased so much that it has significantly increased the survival rates of newborns who are born with severe medical complications or fragile babies, um, as we call them, and they survive with lots of needs in their development. Um, this pushes healthcare systems and clinicians to improve the care offered to these babies, even after they are out of the danger to improve their quality of life. Feeding difficulties is a major concern leading to late hospital discharge of the newborns, um, which is going to add to parental stress because they can't take their newborn baby home soon enough. And also it is going to be a healthcare burden to any country if we have uh, babies who are going to stay in the hospital for a very long period of time. On the other hand, feeding difficulties resulting in aspiration in neonates can be more harmful uh, due to the damage it can cause to their immature developing lungs and its severity also affecting their quality of life uh, for a very long time in their lifespan. So our actions for early detection and early intervention as a country um, and as a healthcare system should be robust. So let's look at um, some of the general principles um, of um, how we should be offering management for neonates. Um, so I will go through each of these uh, topics or debates uh, from here onwards during this talk. Um, so the first one is about the service delivery uh, for newborn babies. Uh, there are different service delivery models um, when we are looking at neonates or pediatric population. But we very often talk about multidisciplinary versus interdisciplinary team care. And now there's an upcoming model as well called transdisciplinary care, which is also a deviation uh, from interdisciplinary, but moving a little bit progressive uh, towards a progressive pathway. Um, so I will talk about uh, how we can use this team um, care model um, 
for neonatal feeding management. Um, and I will also share some thoughts on anecdotal versus scientific evidence in neonatal feeding management. I felt this is going to be really important to address at this time um, because it's a hot topic right now with the expansion of social media, even to the length of offering uh, health advices. Um, the other point that I want to um, talk about is uh, this debate or this um, argument about whether to treat swallow pathophysiology or to treat swallow symptoms in babies. Um, next one, of course, leading to how to treat uh, or how to manage um, the need for accurate and reliable assessments. And I will talk about um, this, um, this important question about is feeding intervention all about developing sucking skills in babies. So um, we'll talk about what are the primary goals and what we need to be looking at in um, feeding um, intervention. Finally, um, I, will some, uh, I will share some strategies to build up a positive feeding environment to any baby at any setting. Um, so first we will talk about the care models. So, it's very interesting. Um, now everybody is using ChatGP to um, answer some, get answers to questions that they feel like kind of not having clear boundaries to. So like any other uh, tax savvy person living in 2023, I also wanted to see what the ChatGPT has to say about this. So I asked the question, what is the preferable care model for neonatal um, feeding management? And here is the response. So, of course, the chat JPT um, listed out some characteristics of both the uh, KR models. So, multidisciplinary team is a group of professionals from different disciplines working independently, focusing on their own specialized area of expertise. Um, and they conduct their own assessments and interventions within their field with limited collaboration and the communication occur through periodic meetings or written reports. But when it comes to um, interdisciplinary team care, this is a group of professionals, again from different disciplines, but actively collaborate and integrate their knowledge and skills to develop a comprehensive and unified treatment plan for um, each client or the baby in this um, case. Um, and the communication in interdisciplinary team care model is more frequent and ongoing than, the, uh, than in multidisciplinary team care. So that's the main difference between these two uh, care models. So let's see how we can determine which model we can use in our setting. Um, so I just jumped into talking about team care models, because I think we don't need to even talk about the importance of team care anymore, because no single professional can support a baby to achieve the holistic outcomes that we are expecting them to achieve. That is why we have different specialties, expertise among us. That is why we have all come together um, for this discussion today, because we all want to be part of this team. Um, and interesting, something that I um, observed recently is that not only clinicians, we also need researchers at the same time to move forward in our care provision. Um, I observed uh, recently that many of the hospitals um, in high and middle income countries are establishing research positions within the hospital uh, to fully focus on clinical based research. They they do not necessarily have the same healthcare background as we would expect, but they would come with specialties like um, quantitative data analysis or um, running surveys, running qualitative data analysis, but will work in a research team within the hospital to promote the hospital-based research. So which is actually important in improving the clinical outcomes of that uh, clinical placement as well. So literature has uh, 
very strong evidence to support both multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary team care models. Um, so the debate of implementing a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary care model depends on several factors um, like determinants. Uh, so the first thing is about the clinical setting. Do we have that capacity in our clinical setting to implement a team care model? That is very important question. Um, so that's the first one. The next one is um, the mode of care delivery. Delivery. Are we looking at only on-site care? Uh, because if we are looking at on-site care, lack of professionals in that clinical placement or the hospital can be a challenge. Uh, because I know that most of the uh, hospitals in remote areas will not have speech and language therapists. So that is going to be a challenge to initiate this team um, care model. But if we think about a hybrid or a remote care model, options for, a options for having a complete team operation is possible because people can join in remotely uh, to have this team um, contribution. Um, also, the members of the clinical team obviously depends on the type of clinical population that we are working on. Um, so depending on the need of each baby that we are managing, the way the team operates and the members in the team may change. Another very important factor is team specialities and dynamics. In a team, every member, um, including the families um, and all the professionals, should be valued for their contribution and the expertise that, can, the, that they can bring into the team and to the care of this baby. And the team should be a respectful environment um, to each, each other's clinical scope and not to violate professional boundaries. Um, in literature, this has been identified as a major barrier when implementing team care because some professionals would feel threatened or some professionals would um, feel that they cannot be openly sharing their skills or expertise in the team because um, later on, they will not be able to uh, uh, be involved in team care uh, because other uh, professionals will be able to continue without their contribution. So this is a huge barrier identified in the literature. Um, further, the family should be actively involved and agreements should be made on the intervention plans uh, while discussing the care pathway for the baby. Finally, the workload and resources. Even if we tick all the boxes above, with the workload, um, it may not be able to um, have collaborative combined sessions or discussions to promote interdisciplinary care. And the resources such as time, cost, have a huge impact on deciding the care model. I think this factor will decide the type of care model we have um, or what is feasible um, in our cl clinical context in Sri Lanka most of the time. Okay, I think um, I'm going to move to the next debate, um, anecdotal versus scientific evidence. Um, so I felt uh, to talk about this topic, I would take a very simple but very close to our lives kind of an example about COVID-19 to explain the differences between these two types of evidence. I'll give you a few minutes to look at these pictures. So there are two types of evidence on the left side of the screen and the right side. Um, so if we, um, I will tell you what is anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence is evidence or information. We wouldn't even consider evidence in, uh, by most of the um, researchers or experts. Um, they are only based on personal observation. Um, and collected in a casual or non-systematic manner. But on the other hand, scientific evidence is based on reliable, systematic, and objective manners of testing, which can generate similar results if we replicate the research design correctly. 
So during COVID, I think more than any time other, um, else, we have seen the use of anecdotal um, information um, for, to not to catch COVID and also to manage COVID, um, not only in Sri Lanka, but in uh, everywhere across the world as well. Um, so this is the difference between anecdotal and scientific evidence. So to discuss about these types of evidences in our clinical practice, I have two types of statements um, that I want to show you. Um, so read these statements carefully. In this left side box A, I have included a few comments or statements actually. I collected on popular social media platforms like podcasts and blogs commonly used by clinicians around the world. Uh, these are not targeting speech uh, therapy, um, clinical practice or Sri Lankan context. These, are, um, these comments were taken from internationally highly reputed um, blogs or when you post comments as reviews or, and um, to podcasts and blogs. Um, so these are examples of anecdotal information. I will give you some time to read the comments. This right side box, uh, B, um, these are some statements I made about evidence-based clinical practice. These are examples of scientific evidence. So you can read these statements as well. So I will, now I have a question posted on Mentimeter again. I want you to think about what type of um, evidence or statements would make you comfortable uh, to choose a therapy approach or an assessment method when you are working in the clinical context. If you can go back to Mentimeter, you can select um, which type that you would like to um, implement more comfortably. Let me show the responses. Like before you can, um, if you, okay, I will show you. If you have joined um, recently, you can scan the, uh, the QR code or otherwise if you are already in Mentimeter, you can use um, the next slide. Which type of evidence we would like to implement? Um, evidence in box A, box B, or both types, or no, not so sure right now. You? But I'm pretty sure that we actually hear or sometimes we even say these statements in box A as well, right? We always talk about what works well for us or what worked well with another clinician and um, how we could um, actually apply that technique for clinical practice. <sighs> Okay, all right, so yeah, without waiting um, further, I will just move, continue with the presentation. Thank you for the responses.
eight means. Okay. So, so the question is what we really should be applying in our clinical practice. Um, I, I, I see some people, majority who responded saying box B or scientific evidence. And there's, a, some, there's another group saying that we should apply both. So um, it is recommended to use scientific evidence which are more objective and reliable. So when you are managing rare clinical uh, presentations or babies with multiple medical etiologies that is not probably not the common um, clinical population that you are working with, that management can be tricky. So it is always useful to look for case studies, um, articles based on case studies, as they can be a guide to our management. If, um, if you are working with a rare uh, condition, um, probably there are a few articles based on these um, babies and their management if you look into the literature. So that will be a guide or a framework for you to base your intervention plans on. Um, and the other important thing is um, we don't really need to neglect anecdotal evidence. If you feel strongly about your clinical observations, that you see patterns for many years that this technique works or this doesn't work with this group, but you cannot seem to find satisfactory amount of evidence, scientific evidence in the literature, probably that is a good start for your research, uh, research project because you are already familiar with this context and you know what is out there in the research literature. So it's probably you can investigate your anecdotal um, hypothesis. That's how research questions uh, are based on. So anecdotal information are also important. Um, so another thing that I want to highlight is there is no criticism or underestimation for having anecdotes. We all have anecdotes as clinicians. As we go along, we get more and more um, anecdotes. Um, that's how you get experience in the field. Um, the message that I want to share is, but as clinical professionals, we need to be responsible and scientific evidence offers that strong backing to our clinical decision making uh, because the scientific evidence are mostly based on trial, tested, controlled environments. So it's very safe to, uh, it's mostly safe to try these um, evidence based practices in our clinical context. Okay, we are quickly moving to the next um, debate, below pathophysiology versus overt symptoms. So this is extremely important when we are managing neonatal feeding difficulties because we will not be having patient reported symptoms as we would get from older kids or adults, as I mentioned before, because babies will not be complaining about dysphagia. So, but with feeding difficulties, we will see common symptoms. Um, it may not be only unique to feeding difficulties, but some common symptoms um, such as regurgitation, vomiting, reflux, or indications of discomfort, like crying, um, and changes in vital signs, such as higher um, heart rate, higher temperature, higher respiratory rate or hypoglycemia, uh, these kind of uh, changes in vital um, signs will also be observable. So these symptoms are unlikely to give a clear picture on what's happening in the swallowing mechanism. We are unable to predict or interpret what is going wrong in this uh, oropharyngeal region to cause these symptoms. So it's important that we look for methods to understand swallow pathophysiology that can explain the symptoms or clinical presentation of the neonates. 
So there is strong scientific evidence claiming that infants and children with different pathophysiology can present with similar clinical um, symptoms. So one of the very important studies, um, Rommel et al. Um, conducted in 2008, they have looked at um, kind of like a case study of a few um, kids diagnosed with a genetic condition, but they are presented with similar clinical symptoms. And when they did video um, um, manometry, so they did video fluoroscopy and manometry together, video fluoroscopy to look at what is happening in the oropharyngeal and esophageal region and manometry to look at pharyngeal and esophageal um, motility differences. So they found that even though these um, group of kids present with similar um, symptoms of um, dysphagia, they all have different pathophysiology. So it's very important that um, we consider that if we are thinking about categorizing uh, babies or even kids uh, according to the symptoms that are present. On the other hand, some mild or acute conditions may be asymptomatic. Um, for example, asymptomatic hyperglycemia or low blood sugar is a common risk for newborn babies. And very important, silent aspiration is more common in babies than with older children or adults, as newborns don't have that matured cough reflex to protect their airway. And it will be visible, um, cough reflex usually starts to be visible functionally around four to eight weeks after birth. So here I want to show this video clip of video for a copy of a, um, a month old baby. Uh, this babe, this is not a neonat, um, it's definitely one month plus, but I chose this video because um, infant structures are very difficult to be under, um, um, interpret in video fluoroscopy. So this is a little bit of an older baby, uh, but I wanted to show you how this swallowing pathophysiology are actually not indicating uh, signs or symptoms uh, if we are just observing the baby from outside. I will show this video probably will slowly uh, take it again. So it's really fast, as you can see, the baby is bottle fed. Uh, this black patch is the, uh, the bolus with the contrast material. So this is the oropharyngeal region. Now um, that's a little pause. This is mandible. Okay. So I will play this slowly again. So if you look at this video, you can see uh, the mandible changes. So indicating sucking, and then this um, vellicular space and piriform space, uh, space getting the bolus material, and then initiating a swallow, and then it goes through the upper esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. So if you look at this video a little bit further, There are lots of sucks here in this one. And yes, followed. And in the next one, one, two, three, four, five, six, probably seven. And then there's this tiny black patch, which indicates that bolus material entered the level of vocal folds, which is known as penetration. So tiny bit uh, entering the air space, but we did not see any difficulties or any changes to the movements of the baby. Baby continues to uh, feed. But again, quick sucking and swallowing, safe swallowing. And then this one, one, two, three, four. Lots of sucking. And as you can see, bolus material stays in the, collects in the piriform and molecular space. And baby is pausing, longer pause, and pause below initiated. 
this is bolus material entering the airway space and passing the level of vocal folds, true vocal folds, entering to the lower respiratory tract, which is known as aspiration. And because the baby does not um, try to uh, clear the air space or uh, to prevent that aspiration, this is known as silent aspiration. But if you observe this baby from outside without this video microscopy, you wouldn't even realize that the baby is aspirating if you are just observing. Um, so that is why I wanted to uh, show you that by looking at overt symptoms, we may not be able to figure out what is wrong in the swallowing physiology or swallowing mechanism. So in this baby, the reason um, it is not important only to look at why, whether aspiration or penetration happens uh, using video fluoroscopy, but because that wouldn't say a lot to us to plan our intervention. But if we look at this baby, the reason why this baby was aspirating is the baby had increased suck swallow ratio. The suck swallow breath coordination got disorganized. So uh, as long as the baby keeps bolus material closer to the airway in the piriform, the higher the risk. So babies who have more than three sucks per swallow are at higher risk of aspiration uh, that is found in literature. So by watching this video, we were able to identify that this baby silently aspirates. And the cause of that is when the baby takes lots of sucks, uh, for a swallow. So that is the, uh, the disordered swallowing mechanism. I hope that was clear video to you. So that takes us to the next topic. So how do we need to use our assessments to clearly identify this pathophysiology in swallowing mechanism? So um, to give you a little bit of an outline about uh, swallowing assessment or feeding assessment, according to international guidelines, such as um, ASHA, American Speech and Hearing Association, and RCSLG, Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, UK, uh, swallowing assessment should be conducted by a qualified speech and language therapist. The swallowing feeding assessment is not a mere screening of 10 to 15 minutes. We cannot complete a whole assessment within that time period. It's a very thorough process consisting of few steps, sometimes few clinical visits even. We will collect the history using standard history formats used specifically for neonatal low infant group. There are different uh, history formats um, to be used for bottle-fed babies, breastfed babies, or babies who have alternative feeding methods. Um, and then feeding observations are made in the NICU or at PBU or in the ward or um, at home or when the baby comes to the outpatient clinic. Um, these um, feeding observations are very important that we observe babies in their natural environments. So what we have found during this COVID period is that WhatsApp seems to be very helpful as an asynchronous uh, method of feeding observations. We could ask parents to do some recording of the feeding times at home and then share it with clinicians so we can provide recommendations or give some feedback. Um, because we need to do these observations without distracting the baby's feeding time as much as possible. Um, it is uh, after feeding observ observation, um, interviewing parents or caregivers to understand the nature of feeding problem and its impact is also very important. We need to know whether the parents are highly stressed about this condition and what are the um, the remedies or the strategies that the parents use to manage the feeding problems, or are they clearly fine and um, not even observing that the baby has a feeding problem? So it's very important to understand their perspective on this issue as well, because if they don't see that there's a feeding problem, um, whatever the recommendations or um, techniques that you would 
suggest will not be productive because they wouldn't try to use it. Um, then um, there are different uh, types of questionnaires that we could use to get information from the parents or caregivers in this context. It's very useful to use these kind of parent reported questionnaires because you can use it as an outcome measurement as well, because you can use the parent reported questionnaire score at the beginning of your intervention and after three months, six months, just to see how the parents uh, reported uh, feeling problems are resolving. Um, next step is a swallow screen. It is really important when we do uh, when we are dealing with uh, babies with meal by mouth or no oral uh, feeds um, that we do a screen first to identify whether this baby has the capability of protecting the airway for a swallowing assessment even or to try oral trials even. Um, so before conducting a detailed clinical assessment, um, it is recommended that a careful screening should be conducted to check the airway safety. Um, then we come to the detailed clinical feeding assessment, um, or we call it as the bedside swallowing evaluation. This is really useful to understand and observe the physical responses of the baby to feeding. Um, that should not be the only uh, information that we collect in ideal situations. This should be followed by instrumental following assessments. But realistically, in our context, in most settings, we will have to make our diagnosis or clinical recommendations after completing the clinical assessment when instrumentation is not available. Um, we also will work with GI specialists um, to understand esophageal phase of swallowing um, if there are indications um, of esophageal involvement as well. So uh, this is a um, picture of commonly used instrumental assessments for neonates, um, except um, I'm going to talk about radiofrescopy and um, fees or flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing in the next slide. Apart from these two, other instrumentations are not uh, properly available for clinical purposes at the moment for neonates. Um, so, and I wanted to show from each instrument what phase that we can actually look at. So dynamic ultrasound is commonly used in research for younger kids to look at oral pharyngeal phase and the involvement of hyoid bone uh, displacement during swallowing. High resolution impedance manometry is a coming up um, instrument in research and um, clinically in adult population in some clinical settings as well. That actually allows us to look at how the pressure changes can cause feeding problems in pharyngeal and esophageal um, levels. Radiofluoroscopy can visualize oral pharyngeal esophageal uh, phases as well as airway protection. These can actually look at pharyngeal phase and airway protection. Nasal airflow uh, thermistor, respiratory inductance, uh, plethysmography, all these. Um, respiratory uh, measure can, um, instruments that are commonly used in sleep related um, studies are helpful in looking at airway protection during swallowing. Um, because in Sri Lanka, we have radiofluoroscopy and fees commonly. Uh, I will talk about the importance of fees and radiofluoroscopy and their um, pros and cons. Um, so we saw a video fluoroscopic video first. So in video fluoroscopy, uh, we would uh, give the baby to swallow uh, bolus material using bottle feeding um, with a contrast material. And then uh, it's like video x-ray that we take very fast pictures of um, the oropharyngeal region. Then, then it comes as a video clip of the whole swallowing. So we can uh, take the lateral view as well as anterior posterior view. Uh, in fees, we use an endoscope with a tiny camera at the end of it. 
and inserting it through a nostril, sit just above the epiglottis in the velopharyngeal region. And then we can record and see, um, this is how you would see, um, we give the material, usually some food colorings are used. Um, so then we know um, this is the bolus material. Otherwise, if we are using like water, it would be very difficult to um, see difference with mucus and other secretions in the, uh, the in this region. So videophoroscopy and fees are most commonly used instruments and they have their pros and cons. Videophoroscopy, as I mentioned before, allows us to visualize the whole process of swallowing as it happens. Um, hope you remember the bottle-fed baby's video clip I showed before. In contrast, fees focus on visualizing airway before and after a swallow because it sits just um, above the epiglottis in the velopharyngeal region. When swallowing, swallow reflex happens due to pharyngeal constriction, our camera visibility gets really blocked and we are not seeing what's happening during the swallow itself. So we are going to see what is happening before the swallow and just after the swallow in feast. Video fluoroscopy is the most reliable um, instrumentation to identify aspiration and we can clearly identify what causes aspiration. When does it happen and what uh, physiological mechanism or what physiological component leads to aspiration uh, through the diaphoroscopy. In fees, because we can't see what is happening during the feeding, sometimes uh, we will see materials in the, um, the trachea or the larynx, but we can't see how it happened. While uh, video fluoroscopy can offer a complete picture of swallow mechanism, um, Fees offer useful information about swallow related airway safety. Another advantage of video fluoroscopy is that we have objective measures developed for uh, swallowing in children, along with risk factors for neonates or infant group. Um, but there are no objective measures for infants through fees, and the interpretation can often be very subjective um, among clinicians and even. Um, if you look at um, a report of a baby's uh, fees um, now and then three months, the way you there is no way for you to compare because um, it's very subjective interpretation. But one disadvantage of video fluoroscopy is that it's radioactive. So we need to be very, very careful uh, on test duration when we are testing neonates. Um, because we don't have to radiate them for a longer period because their structures are still developing and um, cell mat um, um, maturation issues can happen for radiation exposure for a long time. Um, and the other thing is that in video fluoroscopy, because we need to swallow some bolus with contrast material, we cannot test dry swallows. If we are testing babies who are with nil by mouth, we need to do a screening first to see whether the baby is ready for oral trials. Otherwise, we can't go for video fluoroscopy. And also, for obvious reasons, because we cannot add contrast material to uh, the breast into ma mothers, we cannot test breastfeeding. We need to get uh, the babies to do bottle feeding for video fluoroscopic administration. On the other hand, fees um, can test breastfeeding because it's just an endoscope in the um, uh, nasopharynx um, and dry swallows uh, without an issue because you don't necessarily need to give oral trials. But it's an invasive procedure because we need to put this endoscope inside the nostrils. The procedure can be difficult for babies to tolerate. So with the comparison you saw, there are several questions that we need to answer before choosing the instrumental assessment. So of course, what type of feeding method that we need to assess. So if we are particularly interested to look at difficulties in breastfeeding, video fluoroscopy may not be a feasible option because there are physiological differences between breastfeeding and bottle feeding. Of course, there are similarities as well, but evidence um, is very clear that these um, phenomena are too different to each other. Um, second is what information we need. Do we need to look at difficulties in sexual breath coordination 
or issues in oral phase, then videophoroscopy is the preferred option because we can see the oral cavity as well as airway mechanism. Um, finally, we also need to think about presence of any contraindications when recommending the test. So fees may not be recommended uh, for babies who are depend on oxygen. So babies who have a history of oxygen desaturation, if they have a nasal cannula, we are not going to do fees on them um, because that can cause um, nasal obstruction further. And also babies have babies who have NG feeding in place um, and history of nasal obstruction due to tumors or structural deficits. Video fluoroscopy is not suitable for babies um, who are not ready for oral feeding. So extremely premature babies, uh, of course, because of radiation reasons, and they are not ready for oral feeding, we are not doing a video fluoroscopy. And um, there are some groups of babies who are allergic to many medication, and then we are wondering whether they would be allergic to our contrast material, like allergies to barrier. Um, so then if that is a risk, we are not recommending video fluoroscopy. Also, uh, as I said before, clinicians would avoid video fluoroscopy for babies who would require regular x-rays to limit radiation exposure. So if we are dealing um, with conditions which require medical um, professionals to take a lot of x-rays of the baby, different parts of the body, then we know that already they need to be exposed to radiation. So we will not add video fluoroscopy to their care pathway because that will further enhance their radiation exposure. So if we don't have video fluoroscopy or fees, what can we do in your context? Um, so this next thing is um, probably not the pop popular opinion, but cervical auscultation is not instrumental assessment. And if you look at literature, it's very criticized um, for not being reliable and accurate. Uh, even if we um, look at um, intra rate reliability, one clinician doing um, cervical auscultation on one baby for a long time, but still uh, it's not giving us reliable or accurate information. I know this was addressed um, yesterday um, by Ms. Lakshika when she was talking to um, our speech and language therapy colleagues um, about pediatric feeding management. Um, uh, cervical auscultation is not a very commonly used practice in other countries um, for spillowing assessment. But you can use a pediatric stethoscope if you want to listen to respiratory sounds um, and also to check if the NG placement is correctly done. But that can be done by a, a nursing officer or a medical doctor as well. But if you really feel that respiratory, I should be checking respiratory function during sexual breath coordination, then the stethoscope a stethoscope would help, but not for swallowing sounds, because the criticism related to it is that from the sounds that we are hearing, there is no um, research basis or scientific basis to say that these sounds are swallow related sounds. And then we can't correlate the mechanism, uh, swallowing mechanism to the sounds that we are hearing. Um, Another simple instrumentation or tool that we could use is the pulse oximeter. I recommend using pulse oximeter as much as possible to understand sexual breath coordination in babies. It's a, it's a low cost, but very useful when combined with your clinical observation of feeding time. So um, if we think about going back to the, the video fluoroscopic video of that bottle fed baby, sometimes if you connect the baby to um, um, pediatric oximeter, pulse oximeter, you will probably see differences in oxygen saturation during the time that, that the baby aspirated. That by looking at the baby, we will not see any signs, but if we were checking the oxygen saturation, we could see some differences um, because the air wave was getting blocked by bolus material. So it's a very useful clinical uh, tool. 
Um, also, um, uh, we, we got some very promising data confirming a new method of simple video analysis with excellent internet reliability that can be used in uh, many of the local clinical settings. I'm very proud um, to share that these findings um, came from two undergraduate research projects conducted by Ms. Dilimi Pereira and um, Ms. Buddhika Prasangi, uh, graduates uh, from our SHS Batch 10. Um, so we are currently working on, um, they are working on their manuscript. So hopefully we will uh, hear more about their methods um, uh, within a few months. Um, we are moving to the next um, topic. Is it all about developing second skills when it comes to feeding intervention? Um, to address this um, question, I will talk about some common clinical practices that we see in our everyday life when it comes to neonatal feeding. Um, so feeding intervention is usually managed by SLTs following a comprehensive assessment. So therapeutic principles are different to following rehabilitation we use for adults with acquired dysphagia because we talk about following rehabilitation with adults. So we are helping them to relearn uh, the skill of uh, swallowing. But for neonates, we just get the fresh brains with no um, proper uh, prior knowledge or skill of swallowing. So therapeutic principles are very different. And there are two perspectives for intervention uh, with neonates. We need to look at swallowing and feeding both. So swallowing, we look at it as a skill, um, as a physiological mechanism um, by using um, theories of motor learning, um, theories of neurodevelopment, pharyngeal maturation. On the other hand, we look at feeding as a very holistic concept. It's a larger concept, uh, like a so probably a social um, structure um, that swallowing is one part of that, but it's all about that feeding environment, like a social um, aspect to that. Um, so SLTs work with occupational therapists, physiotherapists very closely to facilitate this feeding environment in feeding management um, in terms of um, positioning uh, management and sensory integration, we work very closely as a team. When conducting therapy, we need to be mindful that inappropriate strategies will result in unpleasant feeding experiences to the babies, which can lead to behavioral and sensory related feeding conditions in later life. And not only feeding, but they, they will have sensory integration issues if we unnecessarily um, try to um, do too much of intervention when they are neurologically not ready for swallowing. One common question I always get from mothers is why can't we breastfeed our babies when I know that my baby is sucking my finger or that the baby is sucking on um, their thumb itself. So the answer is that we are talking about two different phenomena. Sucking baby's thumb is visible in in vitro uh, scans from around 15 gestational weeks. Um, as you can see in this top right uh, ultrasound scan image. But that doesn't mean by that uh, time, the fetus is ready to oral feed. So this phenomenon is known as non-nutritive sucking. From the term itself, it says that it's, for, it's not for nutritional purposes. But babies do need to have non-nutritive sucking because it helps them as a self-soothing behavior. That is why you see babies sucking their thumbs to fall asleep and sometimes they would continue to do so uh, as toddlers even. Uh, so non-nutritive sucking is also seen in breastfeeding babies. Uh, so that's how they initiate breastfeeding. They would start non-nutritive sucking at the beginning of breastfeeding to initiate milk extraction, which is known as milk ejection reflex. And afterwards they change it to nutritive sucking. 
we will talk about nutritive sucking in the next slide. So non-nutritive sucking is only a prerequisite um, for oral feeding, and it cannot be the determining factor for the readiness of oral feeding in a baby. But speech and language therapists can use um, non-nutritive sucking appropriately in a systematic manner to facilitate nutritive sucking and suck swallow coordination. Um, they can recommend this to prepare the baby for feeding time, um, to show that baby that um, so the baby is also actively involved rather than just putting the bottle or the, um, the breast nipple into the baby's mouth. We can help the baby to be prepared for the feeding time by doing non nutritive sucking. Also, letting the baby uh, to suck uh, the breast will help the mothers to increase their mother uh, milk secretion. Uh, so this can be used to mothers who struggle um, to lactate at the very beginning um, of the, um, the childbirth um, because then nominative sucking uh, by sucking on the mother's nipple uh, that will help uh, the mothers to secrete more milk for the baby. There are also some tools like you can see on the right side bottom picture, uh, some tools to support non-nutritive sucking um, that are in the market um, currently. But um, a small finger of the mother or the clinician um, can be used productively um, for similar outcomes. So that we don't really necessarily need these um, tools for that. Um, especially in our local context, um, these tools can be expensive and does not offer anything new. But you need to be very careful if you're a clinician, if you're using um, gloves um, uh, to check uh, if the baby has any uh, history of allergic reactions to surgical gloves or the chemical materials in that before using gloves. Next, nutritive sucking. This is what we really need to see in babies to um, see that they are ready for um, oral feeding. Um, so nutritive sucking is a highly coordinated and physiologically and functionally different um, concept than non-nutritive sucking. This nutritive sucking is evident in fetuses around 28 weeks of gestation and it develops during 34 to 36 weeks of gestation. However, the baby needs to be born and learn to breathe air through the lungs to master the skills of suck swallow breath coordination. So just because the baby knows how to do nutritive sucking doesn't mean the baby can have oral feeding successfully because just after birth only the baby can learn how to inhale and exhale air through lungs. So then that suck swallow breath coordination breath part comes after birth. So the baby needs to practice this skill to have successful um, oral feeding. Premature babies who are born before 36 weeks are not neurologically prepared to suck and swallow. That is the primary reason um, for keeping them nil by mouth till they complete at least 36 weeks of gestation. Uh, so um, we should be really looking at because the literature strongly recommend waiting um, till 36 weeks of gestation. Uh, to start oral feeding, if even oral stimulation to try till 36 weeks or 34 weeks um, uh, before we do any um, large intervention. Um, it is also reported that dysfunctional sucking in babies um, is usually associated with brain injuries, often injuries to brain stem, uh, basal ganglia and thalamus. So that brings us to the next topic um, about cup feeding. Um, so I want to share uh, some literature on cup feeding um, as the next um, topic we are going to talk about. Before that, I know it gets a bit boring that you have to listen to me for a very long time also. Um, I would like you to respond to this question on Mentimeter. How often do you see um, cup feeding uh, babies? Do you uh, or do you uh, recommend cup feeding 
or do you see clinicians using cup feeding? If you scan this barcode, again, you can go to Mentimeter, or if you're already in Mentimeter, you can use the next slide, and I will share the responses. Okay, do you use cup feeding uh, for babies as alternative to breastfeeding? Yes, true, no. I see clinicians using it, yes. I will respond to the questions at the end of the discussion. Yep. Yeah, so it's a very common practice. Um, thank you very much the responses and I'll get back to the presentation. So it was very interesting to see the responses about the practice of cup feeding. It's a common um, practice I see and often has to go against it. Um, this is a highly controversial topic in Asian low resource countries even today. Um, cup feeding has a long history of being used as an alternative feeding method uh, when breastfeeding was not an option. I'm talking about very, very early um, uh, years. But with growing facilities in the world and new developments coming in our field, high resource settings move towards bottle feeding when breastfeeding is not, a, not an option due to um, conditions related to the baby's physiology or related to mother's lactation um, abilities. When oral feeding is not possible, um, NG feeding is recommended. So breastfeeding, if that is not possible, bottle feeding, if the baby is not ready to do, do that, if oral feeding is not um, capable, then um, NG feeding. But WHO and UNICEF are still recommending cup feeding in low resource settings um, where water quality is very poor uh, because the assumption is that it's very easy to clean a cup rather than cleaning a bottle and heaps with different curves because uh, having too much of curves in the bottles and um, the teats will increase the risk of bacterial contamination in these utensils. So that is the simple reason for WHO and UNICEF recommendation of um, recommendation for cup feeding in low resourced um, settings. Um, and that is not based on any positive clinical outcomes for babies feeding skills. Another um, reason why cup feeding became a little popular is that um, in late 90s, this concept called nipple confusion came into limelight. Um, this nipple confusion concept is based on some anecdotal information that babies will refuse breastfeeding if they are given a bottle teat because they get confused of the teat and the nipple. This theory created a huge aversion towards bottle feeding and cup feeding became the next best option after breastfeeding. But this concept, um, since then, this, uh, since the publication, this concept was highly criticized um, and there's plenty of evidence since then to confirm that babies can detect the differences of the textural differences, temper, uh, temperature differences of the bottle teeth and uh, mother's breast nipple, and they can very well adjust their sucking pattern accordingly. Um, cup feeding can be. One second, I'm gonna wait. Yeah. Uh, Okay. No, sorry. So um, cup feeding can be extremely risky because babies are unable to regulate their breathing and swallowing at their own pace, like in suck-swallow breath coordination. So 
Again, taking you back to the, the video of that bottle-fed baby, you remember that the baby was taking lots of poses in between. So that is how the baby is doing suck, swallow, breath coordination. If we are cup feeding, the baby does not get physiological messages to be ready to swallow because they are biologically prepared to suck and then swallow. If they are not sucking, but just somebody pouring milk into their mouth, their brain does not get that message that they should be ready to swallow. And because of that, they will struggle to swallow and then breathe. So this has adverse effects, such as increased risk of aspiration, oxygen desaturation, and also insufficient milk intake. You will see the baby's milk coming out um, um, through anterior spillage, like through um, lips, um, and milk um, sufficiently not getting into the child because the babies are supposed to be latching to whatever the thing that even finger, teeth, uh, breast nipple, they will latch. That's how they are reflexive, uh, brooding reflexes, um, and then preparing them to do that. Um, but if you do um, cup feeding, you will see sometimes if you use this silver little cup, you will see that babies sometimes come and try to do the latch because they are not prepared to take milk from a cup or spoon like older kids or adults do. Um, so the risk of aspiration, oxygen desaturation and insufficient milk intake, they all indicate that the baby is struggling to regulate or coordinate swallowing and respiration. However, I have to say that there are certain circumstances that cup feeding can be recommended, but it should be the last option available to oral feeding with strong justification for positive outcomes. You have to see what, uh, what positive outcomes would come from cup feeding uh, um, other than any other oral uh, feeding methods. There are plenty of articles on this um, cup feeding debate. Um, I will um, share a list of references at the end so um, you can read up a little bit more. Okay, so the final um, topic that I want to talk about is um, that simple strategies to improve the feeding environment of a newborn, any newborn. It could be your own baby, it could be a baby that you see um, clinically, um, it doesn't matter. Whatever these strategies are, co can commonly used by anybody um, to improve uh, and provide a positive environment uh, for the baby's feeding. Um, so, I think we all agree that neonatal feeding is not only about getting nutrition and hydration. It is an essential skill for babies' neurophysiological development as well. So here I'm sharing some evidence of applying this theory called dynamic systems theory to create a supportive feeding environment, which, um, which has proven to have positive outcomes um, by evidence. This theory focuses on providing environmental stimulants to babies to elicit a task. So in here, it's um, the task is, or the skill is feeding. Um, so to create a positive environment, it is vital that um, mother and the baby to have a positive interaction and attachment. Concepts such as um, kangaroo baby care, skin to skin um, are concepts that encourage this attachment, giving a sense of relief to the baby. Um, there are exciting positive outcomes found on this. Uh, babies in the NICU exposed to their mother's voice and heartbeat showing significantly higher weight gain compared to the control group show that babies ability to recognize their mothers. Um, at a very early stage. Also by seeing female, face, female faces, there have been improvements in sucking skills in babies, which is why we recommend uh, mothers to maintain eye contact with the babies during feeding, bottle feeding or breastfeeding to maintain eye contact with their baby. Um, now thinking about um, our reality, um, Sri Lankan and uh, around the world, um, during a, a few months ago, 
During peak of the COVID pandemic, mothers had limited access to their babies in the NICU, which have affected creating a positive feeding environment for these babies who already struggle with feeding. So um, I think as much as we take uh, precautions, all necessary precautions and measures for safety and well-being well of all of us, we also need to advocate for babies and their mothers to have this positive feeding environment and positive interaction as early as possible. So um, sometimes um, a, a few, um, five, 10 minutes, um, two, three times a day uh, would help the baby and mother both um, in terms of developing their interaction. Um, next is that babies need to be physiologically stable with stable breathing pattern and attention to have a successful feeding environment. Babies who struggle with um, respiration should be stabilized before allowing feeding. Otherwise, they will not have the capacity to protect their airway during feeding. So we need to see that the baby is stable, can breathe in, breathe out um, without any support before we start uh, oral feeding. The next thing is baby should be prepared for feeding by allowing to smell and taste breast milk or if breast milk is not possible, formula milk. Um, this also allows babies to be actively engaging in feeding time. As I said during non-nutritive sucking discussion, that babies need to know that this is the time that I'm going to be fed. So the even for us, to see the uh, food plate and to get that smell help us to secrete saliva and to keep our structures ready for uh, chewing and swallowing. In the same manner, babies should be ready to do that. That is why uh, babies should not be fed, orally fed during uh, sleeping time. They should be attentive for feeding um, and awake. Um, I want to emphasize that we can use strategies up to here, even for babies with nail by mouth. So um, that, that is the free uh, feeding, free feeding um, phase. But the decision to give milk orally for taste or nutrition uh, should be decided by a speech and language therapist after a careful assessment. But up to that point, um, in NICU, um, you can do, you can provide these stimulations uh, to improve the baby's feeding environment that will help the baby to be um, ready for oral feeding soon. And if using feeding utensils, um, the speech therapist will carefully select um, to match the baby's skills and feeding needs, um, as I mentioned before. All right. Coming to the end of our session, I, um, I want to um, list out a few future directions uh, of what I think we should um, look at uh, to improve the, the care that we provide for our babies. Um, I know financial barrier is a major challenge when we talk about any developments um, in our country. Still, um, I wanted to highlight what we can do um, for progression. I know that we all agree that we need to keep having training programs to improve the skills of clinicians and to keep ourselves updated. Um, it's very important that we bring that balance and collaboration between researchers and clinicians so that um, clinicians are updated uh, on upcoming evidence-based practices as well as clinicians can update researchers on upcoming clinical questions so the researchers can um, determine their research pathways to answer these clinical questions. So it's really important that we have that strong clinician researcher collaboration. Um, with wonderful clinical work happening in all settings of our country, even during this COVID pandemic, um, which is highly commendable, um, but we also need to look at opportunities to improve research that are designed to answer clinical questions. Um, so we need to think about how we um, share the findings of our important work with a larger audience um, locally and internationally. And we need research that is relevant to our context and our clinical practices. 
Um, sometimes it's very difficult, even though I talk about instrumentals for low assessment and what to choose. Most of the students, I know that there is no instrumentation. So we need research, uh, we need methods uh, that we can use in our clinical context. Um, in swallowing management, um, instrumentation um, in our country is very far behind compared to other countries in the world. Uh, I think it's unfortunate because we have many SLTs in most of the major hospitals in the country, but without necessary resources for them to offer instrumental following assessment findings, um, we are missing that optimal care for our clients. Um, also, we need to train uh, clinicians to administer and interpret the results of instrumental assessments. So it's been like the chicken and egg situation. How can we train clinicians when we don't have instrumentation? And again, how can we get uh, instrumentation when we don't have when we don't have in, um, trained clinicians? Um, so that's a tough situation to um, address, but something that we need to um, think about when moving forward. Also, um, I think we need to address some common but outdated practices through professional bodies. Um, among different professionals, regulatory bodies should collaborate to share skills and knowledge with each other. Um, that is why I think these kind of workshops are really important to keep uh, the team um, informed um, and work collaboratively. Finally, um, this is uh, um, not something um, that I'm really uh, keen, but I think professional bodies should raise awareness uh, on accurate and um, reliable medical information, clearing out common social myths um, related to clinical practices using social media. Even though my social media capabilities are very minimal, I think we need to accept that, um, that it's a common uh, platform for information sharing and use these platforms to spread accurate information. TikTok, um, Instagram, YouTube shorts are filled with inaccurate information shared by people who call um, themselves as influencers. And actually, they can influence thoughts and uh, behavior of millions of followers. So why not we use these platforms to share accurate information. Um, I have seen that many uh, reputed research and clinical institutes are actually going towards TikTok um, you and YouTube shows as a media for raising awareness and to clear some common doubts and also as a promotional uh, mode. So I just got a few pictures of um, uh, TikTok accounts of uh, in Canada, uh, TikTok is banned in government uh, institutes. So even if you are using uh, VPN of government institute, you cannot access TikTok. But interestingly, they have um, TikTok accounts as well. Um, I think we should um, have channels in our own languages to keep our young generations informed of um, accurate information. Um, yeah, to wrap up the session, um, this is the take home message. Um, even if you uh, weren't there from the beginning and was thinking about dinner all throughout the session, I would like you to pay attention to this slide to get the message. Um, so when managing babies with feeding difficulties, we need to remember that they are not miniature dolls. We talk about this in psychology, and I think it's true for swallowing physiology as well because their swallowing is not anatomically and physiologically similar to adults. Uh, babies can be at risk of feeding difficulties if they are born with red flags or risk factors who will need careful monitoring. Feeding management is an essential part of a facility scope and assessment and intervention should be conducted by a speech and language therapist in the team. We need to review evidence for uh, common clinical practices to make informed clinical decisions. Finally, um, facilitating a positive early feeding experience is crucial uh, to determine long-term benefits and improved um, quality of life of babies and their families as we uh, move uh, forward. Um, I will share a list of references soon with all the attendees. Um, and um, yep. 
Thank you so much for um, joining uh, this talk today. And thank you so much to Dr. Shamini Hetiarachi, uh, Padma Gunath, Madam, and SLMA for organizing this um, session and inviting me to talk. I'm honored to be part of this. And um, thank you very much for uh, being um, responsive and um, being here for this talk today. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions about um, the presentation and you are free to email me if you have any questions or solutions. Thank you. So thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Isuru. Um, I mean, I thought it was just a, a phenomenal presentation, really putting in um, the history of uh, neonatology to um, the importance of evidence and, and theories around a practice um, versus anecdotal evidence. Uh, and, and finally, kind of uh, looking to the future as well in terms of how, we, how can we use what's available in terms of tech support um, to, in a, in a way, sort of be influencers, if you like. I'm not a big fan of TikTok myself, and uh, but um, yeah, how do we influence and become influencers of our own practice uh, in in an age where there is so much uh, misinformation uh, and fake news, etc. And uh, it's uh, interesting that you started with chat, um, uh, to, yeah, because in in a way that that is also the the the, the fear, isn't it? Um, so wonderful presentation, um, Isuru. We've got about like nine minutes to wrap things up. L let's have questions, comments from, from colleagues. Let me see, try and read out. Please feel free to um, ask questions or raise your hand. Um, so many, many um, people thanking you, Isuru. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm just trying to see whether there are any particular questions. I thought I might start off by asking you a question, um, Isri, if I may. Um, I thought it was really interesting, the, the comments around uh, cervical auscultation. Um, yes, certainly in my experience in the UK is that you know, people weren't using it. Um, but I know it's something that we have in, in a way inherited from adult work as well into pediatric dysphagia. And there is a push, you know, in, in places like South Africa, for example, where instrumentation is so hard to come by that we become better at using cervical auscultation as an adjunct, not on its own, but as an adjunct to other screening that we use. And I wondered what your thoughts might be on that, Isuru. Um, yeah, madam, uh, the thing is, um, we, like, it's, it's okay if you feel comfortable using cervical auscultation um, to help you decide management options, it's okay to use it. But you need to be mindful that it's not an instrumental assessment and it does not tell you a lot about swallowing mechanisms. So for example, um, some people would uh, say that they are actually listening to the hyoid bone displacement um, where they are listening to swallow sounds. Um, and when we are looking at neonates, hyoid uh, bone is merely a cartilage um, at the beginning uh, of this neonatal period. And that doesn't have any proven um, significance to swallowing mechanism in neonates until about um, one year. And even um, that sound uh, to use a, a stethoscope and to know that this is the correct sound that we are hearing is a problem. But I have seen research where they combine cervical auscultation or digital cervical auscultation or um, accelerometer um, to pick up these sounds uh, from the, um, uh, the hyoid region and then connect it with uh, respiratory instrumentation such as um, nasal platysmography. Then they get um, 
from the uh, from the two in, um, instrumentation, they get two meshes, and then they correlate the meshes to identify when the swallow starts and when the swallow ends. So then that gives a little bit of a clear picture because then we know the sound that we heard through the um, auscultation or uh, stethoscope is what we uh, see, uh, what is the face of swallowing uh, from the platysmography um, graphs. Uh, clinically, uh, another reason is sometimes um, it's we are talking about babies with very tiny structures and um, even just a little change in their head or the neck could cause a sound and that could um, distract our observations. Um, but I understand that it has an important value when we are looking at respiratory um, mechanism. So it should be used uh, for that uh, purpose uh, also um, by speech therapists if they are comfortable, especially pe using a pediatric stethoscope with this group. Thanks so much, Isaru. So we have a question from Nadini. Um, can a pacifier be promoted? to uh, encourage nutritive sucking in neonates? Or can a pacifier be, be used? Um... Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nadini. So um, pacifiers are, um, there are plenty of different pacifi uh, pacifiers out there in the market by different companies um, and promoting different um, uh, aspects. Uh, they have their own clinical uh, research teams to try out their um, tools and then they have um, new research coming up but before choosing uh, before you spend money uh, hundreds of dollars on these um, tools better to read the research article and then actually try to interpret the findings because sometimes I find that they are talking about their statistical um, uh, interpretation is very different and they come up with a very attractive conclusion uh, to suggest that it works, but probably they don't find that um, it doesn't have a bad outcome or positive, it's a neutral one, but in conclusion, they would have very promising findings. So it's um, that is why clinici as clinicians, we need to be very mindful of um, what is the research out there and how to interpret it. Um, pacifiers, as I mentioned before, um, has shown to be useful as the same way that we use our small finger to uh, facilitate non nutritive sucking. That actually helps to um, helps the baby to establish that pattern of sucking and swallowing. But for nutritive uh, sucking purposes, actually it's the baby doing that. It's like that you can't learn swimming without actually jumping into the water. So you have to do that to practice that skill um, on how to regulate sucking, swallowing and breathing. I hope that answers the question. Great question, because um, I know there are different views on it. Um, and great answer as well. So Supun has said, please describe any indicators for silent aspiration instead of instrumental assessments. So what can yeah. guide us? Um, thank you, Supun. So um, as I said before, we found that infants, uh, neonates infants with higher sex swallow ratio are at higher risk of aspiration. So the risk factor cutoff mark is that if a baby is having more than three sucks per swallow, that is a clear indication that the baby is aspirating. You will not see signs of aspiration or you will see signs of aspiration, but if a baby has more than three sucks per swallow, that is a, an indicator of aspiration. That is something that you can very easily identify in your clinical context, even during a feeding observation. Uh, the other thing is that baby's sucks flow ratios are not fixed. Even a baby could have different sucks flow ra uh, ratios within one feeding time. So as clinicians, our job would be, SLT's role would be to how to reduce this higher number of sucks for a swallow in the clinical context so we minimize the risk of aspiration. 
and also to identify why they are sucking this much to initiate a swallow. Lovely, and so from Kumudu, we have a question. Is there any uh, are there any techniques to improve suck swallow breath pattern or that synchrony? Uh, yeah, um, I think one, uh, one aspect is that we um, um, use controlled oral feeding techniques where we would use um, um, similar to non-intuitive sucking by using pacifiers or little goes with um, uh, soaked in milk, breast milk, formula milk, and then we, in a controlled environment that we allow baby to suck it, swallow it, and then breathe. Um, and um, that cannot just happen um, just after a, 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 an assessment. We need to see whether the baby is ready to um, suck and swallow whether there's a swallow uh, trigger also. And then uh, start trying on little amounts. But for that, I think it depends from baby to baby, but that's something you can try um, without just giving a, like a um, like mother's uh, breast filled with milk. We, we can start with smaller amounts, um, even bottle, tiny amounts at the beginning and then connect to an oximeter to check oxygen saturation and um, in a controlled environment and then um, move a little by little with higher volumes and longer periods. Thank you, Isuru. Uh, we have one more question here. Uh, it's a really challenging question as well. Can we get suggestions on how to arrange an MDT or in, uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary even is a rule, um, okay. clinic in remote resource settings? I think you touched on that uh, briefly in terms of uh, connecting remotely. Um, and then there's a second question, but I'll, I'll let you answer that one first, Isru. Yeah, I think it's it's really a, a matter of uh, getting your um, team um, who are willing to start um, team care. Um, that is the first thing. And um, I'm I'm assuming that you are thinking about a remote resource setting means like very under resourced uh, setting with uh, with import uh, with relevant clinicians. I'm not sure. So. Um, I think in Sri Lanka, when we don't have um, clinicians um, in all the settings available, something that I uh, can assure you is that on site that you have a clinician who is like the coordinator and then you connect to uh, people with necessary expertise from other settings and then probably have like a virtual um, a team um, ready for this uh, care and also this team needs to be um, responsible and accountable for the intervention plan so um, everywhere that you would be like whatever the decisions that you make in terms of intervention uh, that the team is aware and informed and uh, they are uh, documented um, evidence about this team management otherwise um, you cannot just connect for example if you don't have a speech therapist on your side um, you can connect to a speech therapist um, remotely, but that speech therapist will still hold um, contribution to that interve intervention in that group. Um, then otherwise you are going to be, uh, if you kind of avoid or skip that uh, clinician from the care model, um, when you are presenting evidence or when you are discussing with the parents, then that seems like that you are going to a scope that is not beyond your professional boundaries. So it's always good to have that um, boundaries well cleared and explained to initiate a clinic. And is that the second? final question? Maybe is it in, in the interest of time? Um, can cup feeds uh, be suggested for babies with cleft palate? Um, 
So cleft palate is um, a condition that babies very quickly pick up. Um, as I said before, they have a very, uh, with their fresh uh, brain and neurophysiology, they quickly learn adaptation. So there are lots of specialized tools, um, bottles, teeth for cleft palate um, that doesn't actually allow nasal regurgitation at the beginning. But um, if you don't have that kind of instrument um, tools, utensils, cup feeding will not have a significant uh, difference. But um, because evidence, if I'm talking about what is out there in literature, it's not a common practice in most of the settings because they have these um, utensils, teeth, specialized teeth. But if you feel that it works, and of course, if the child doesn't struggle with cup feeding, probably that's something you can try. But otherwise, I would recommend you to use a, a, use a regular bottle teeth. And I know in Sri Lanka, sometimes there are bottle teeth um, with a little bit of changes, not like um, this Mr. Brown and um, high-tech um, Heberman feeder kind of devices, but regular bottle feeds with in their box, it says like you can try for um, babies with cleft palate as well. So it's probably uh, the regular, uh, the usual price as well, if you want to try. Um, I would recommend moving ahead with that type of bottles because uh, babies with cleft palate within days and weeks, they learn how to avoid nasal regurgitation and how to um, have a clean, uh, sucks for low pattern uh, very quickly. It's uh, other if they don't have any other associated problems. I'm talking. About. Would that be enough? Thank you so very very much, Isru. Um, I think in the interest of time, we may need to wrap up. Although you very very kindly uh, shared your email, it's, it's up here on the screen. So if there are any uh, questions, we can certainly continue this discussion. It is a discussion to be continued, of course. Um, you know, we started with 77 participants, which on a Sunday evening, uh, Isuru, you know, is all like kudos to you. Um, I think we've lost some just because it's dinner time. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and preparation for, um, you know, the a week ahead. Um, but yeah, what, what a fascinating uh, summary, Isuru, of the importance of working together. I mean, there's no other place where, um, I think in, in our work, where collaboration is more important, right? Where, where it is literally life and death. And if you don't collaborate with your... Um, team members in a in a now we know transdisciplinary way hopefully um you know where we're not doing service to our clients um and and to our very very precious clients who are, who are neonates so thank you very much for really addressing that uh, very important uh, point isuru as well as saying it's all about also i mean it's all about collaborating but also about respecting what each member brings to that team, uh, where you feel comfortable and enabled to uh, be who you are and, and bring your skills to that team. Um, so, so thanks ever so much for that. We look forward to more research from you, Isuru. I really love that idea of a researcher as part of a team in a, in a hospital. Um, here, I think we may need to be uh, practitioner researchers, and that's the call to all clinicians joining us from uh, very busy clinical settings. So we look forward to hearing your uh, of your research and also very particularly about um, assessment and intervention that we can do locally. So very interested in the research that you did with the two students and what that might bring about. So thanks ever so much on behalf of the committee um, and everybody joining today. Uh, please continue to support uh, our journey, Isuru. You're always part of that journey, wherever in, in the world you might be. 
Um, so thank you everyone for joining and uh, may our discussions continue. Take care and stay safe and well. Bye-bye. Have a good night.